Hi everybody, welcome to the workshop today. My name is Emerson Patton and I'm the owner and founder of Bright Business Advice. And I've been giving business advice for 15 years and we specialize in helping electrical contractors to make the most out of the business. But most importantly, for you to free up your time so you can get time to have back with your family and have the money that you want to enjoy doing the things you want to do, the sports you want, the travel you want, the things you want to do with your life. So let's look at what the current environment. There's some real challenges out there, I mean, really turbulent times. Everybody's five year plan has just had to be ripped up and start again. And one of the things we've been doing is looking at you know, what is it that's challenging people out there? And really what I see is it's, it's their ability, their knowledge and their beliefs. They just don't really know what they're supposed to do about what's happening with the environment. So what we're doing is we're going to change that. What we want to do is really help you improve your cash flow, make sure you've got that nailed down so you know exactly what you've got. Then we want to work on the motivation of not only you, but of your staff to make sure everyone knows what they want to do and they're coming back in to work and they're off of furlough and they're putting their effort in. And obviously we want to make sure things are done efficiently and well, especially with the new regulations and the HSE issues. And obviously we're all about making sure that the time management is really good so that the margins come in on the jobs and there's not time wasted. We know it's going to be more challenging on site right now with more challenging things to deal with around the HSE. Okay, so what does Bright do? Well, what we do is we give coaching to people to help them improve, just like an improvement of an athlete by having a coach. They always do that. You never have an Olympic athlete without a coach. Well, if you want to be a great business owner, then you want to have a coach. I have a coach myself. And we coach in either groups with our mastermind programs or one-to-one -one coaching for uh, the bigger businesses that really want to get stuck in and move things forward. But either way, you get one-on-one -on -one coaching just once a month with a mastermind, but more times, twice a month and upwards if you do the full one-to-one -one programs. And what we do is really want to help you take through this model. We've got a seven-sector model that's going to help you structure and grow your business. You see, it's going to give you the peace of mind you're doing things right. We know most of you didn't go and get a degree in business studies or some kind of MBA. What you've done is you've been an apprentice. You've worked up through the ranks. You've got yourself a decent set of skills. Then you start going on a self-employed then you start building people around you before you know it, you've got a company and what you need to know is the frameworks that make it work and we've got our seven sector framework that we're going to explain to you over our uh, upcoming webinar that's going to really help you understand the pieces you need to put in place to make sure you're more profitable you have the peace of mind and you deliver what you need to in terms of getting the work that you want in terms of getting the clients that you want and getting the business that you want so you can get the life that you want on. So the first thing I want to ask you to think about is what your objectives are from this session. What do you want to get? Now, I want you to think about that for a minute and then in the chat, just start putting in what your objectives are, what you want to get out of this session. I'm going to roll along, but there'll be another bit where it'll come up. So I'm just giving you a heads up that I'm going to ask for your objectives. So you need to think about what am I on here for? What do I want to get out of it? What's, what's important to me? Um, and I'm going to carry on sliding through and then there'll be some more opportunity for you to actually put it in the chat in a minute. Um, it's probably a good idea if in the chat you want to put your your name and your email and your phone number as well so that we can all sort of start um, chatting with each other. I'll save a copy of the chat and we can use that as well then. So for those of you who've been to our summits, you'll know that we partner with uh, people like the ECA, Schneider Electric, uh, Simpro uh, Software, HR Solutions, um, Sphere do all the health and safety, uh, Professional Electrician Magazine. So if anybody saw yesterday, Professional Electrician Magazine did a promotion on their digital platform of the event for us yesterday, which is quite good of them. Uh, Bully Davies, one of the accountants I work with who specializes in uh, helping people. Well, actually, he's Paul's accountant, to be fair. That's how I met him. Um, but he's young and dynamic and can help with all the digital stuff as well, which is really good. So the agenda for today, we want to go through leadership the success mindset what do you need to be thinking of the way you need to be thinking in order to get uh, success from this session uh, and not only from this session but going forward what do your team need to see what do your customers need to see um, you know what do you need to be seeing when you look in the mirror um, because you know leadership is about doing that self-analysis as well the second thing we'll look at is cash flow basically cash is king right now you've got to make sure you're organizing your cash because if you haven't got the cash, you won't have a business. And businesses all operate on cash. And then communication. It's all about the way you communicate, both internally, 
with your teams and externally because what you say now will be remembered for years to come within your team and the way you look after them and support them will actually be remembered um, by your suppliers your customers and by your team so it's hugely important that you communicate in the right way right now so i often say to people well you drive your business but who drives you I mean, I do kettlebell lifting. I've got, a, in fact, I've got sores all over my hands right now because at the weekend, my kettlebell instructor pushed me to do an extra minute, five minutes of double kettlebells, which nearly broke me. But I wouldn't do that myself. But having somebody else there pushing you along and watching you makes you want to do it. So what we do is we create an environment with either the mastermind um, or with one-to-one -one coaching where you've got that pushing you through if you think about athletes top athletes all top athletes in the world right now they still have a coach because a coach pushes them don't you think otherwise you know mo farrow is pretty good at running right you know why does he bother having a coach it, you know it's because they have people that help get you to commit to the training that you need to do to doing the hard yards and the back office stuff that really you don't want to do because you'd rather be doing the bits you like doing but actually it's that it's that other um support that drives you on having somebody there to push you forward uh as part of what we're doing just to give you an idea um i am giving um 10 percent to little miracles i am the chair of little miracles um so i uh I'm, I'm, I'm literally if you think you're having a bad time in business the charities tap has just turned off we were getting between 18 and 20 grand a month from commercial from corporate businesses and literally went down to 56 quid at one time so it's absolutely horrendous so i'm giving 10 percent of anybody who books a strategy session with me or uh, wants to go on the master classes or wants a crisis call i'm giving 10 percent of that to little miracles and um the electrical industries charity that the eca support as well so the challenges I see out there right now with leadership um, are really uh, uh, this leadership in a crisis. Does anyone, what do you think the word crisis means in the English language? When we talk about a crisis, what do you think we're talking about? Um, I'm going to have to pick on people if we don't hear someone chat. What does a crisis mean? Julian, what do you think a crisis means? Um, a problem that's got to be overcome. Um, something that was not of your planning and something that's cropped up that um, needs addressing and yeah, pretty damn challenging, isn't it? That's what it is. We're in the middle of a crisis. Would you all agree? It's been a bit of a, everything's been turned on its head. But mm. interestingly, I heard the other day that the, in Chinese, the word crisis actually means opportunity riding a dangerous wind. That's what it means. So what they're saying is it's actually, this is an opportunity. So what you choose to do now with it will make a huge difference. And the way you, um, uh, I, I, I talk about these guys, there's two guys in the jungle, right? And they're, we're well, not really a jungle, more of a plane, yeah? And one's putting trainers on. And the other goes, what are you putting trainers on for? He said, well, there's lions over there. He says, you'll never be able to outrun a lion. He says, don't need to outrun a lion, just need to outrun you. <laughs> and that's what it's about. It's like, just you've just got to be a bit better than the people around you. That's all it is. Um, so yeah, so in a crisis, you know, we got people where, you know, you've got to demonstrate your responsibility, but also see who's stepping up in your team. Uh, I had an interesting one. I had a client the other day, 17 staff members. He sent an email out. Okay, we're ready to come back now. Uh, three people went, fantastic, can't wait, been sick of sitting at home, bored, since this kid's driving me nuts, ready to go. And the other rest of them were like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to come back. I want to stay on furlough, fancy having my holiday through the summer and all the rest of it. Low Very true. Rubbish. Very true. You found that same thing, yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Yeah. So actually, this is where we've got to inspire people. And, uh, and, I'm, and, and I'm sure um, when Paul said, okay, everybody, we're going back, you had, a, you had a different vibe, didn't you, mate? Everybody was just like ready to go, weren't they? Yeah. Kept communicating with the team all the way through. We were furloughed for seven weeks, the whole team was. Um, kept communicating and I've now got 70% of them back to work and basically they're all sitting at there waiting for that call to say let's get back so communicate yeah. that. 
communication and the culture that you'd built really was ready for that. So obviously we've got to help people understand anxiety. You know, we know there's going to be anxiety about their, about the, uh, about the way they're feeling. So we've got to demonstrate empathy and understanding from where they're coming from. Um, but we've got to show them how we're going to address it and how they're going to be safe. And also about the, co the, the culture. It's probably the most important thing that you can foster within your organization. And if you haven't developed a culture, i.e. you consciously sat there and developed one like Paul and I did, it, you know, with his business, it, 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 it'll just be whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? It's whatever has kind of come together. If you want to make something, you've actually got to start physically taking steps to create the culture you want and, and, and driving that through your business by the way you recruit people, the way you hire, the way you fire, the way you keep everybody on, the way you celebrate your culture and what you're doing. Um, so there's this culture in a crisis. Um, there's also like, how are we working from home effectively? If people are working from home, have you got regular check-ins with them? Are you doing Zoom meetings, well-being meetings? Even if they're on furlough, are you offering them a chance to connect in and like Paul was saying, like staying in touch, stay in touch meetings and things like that. Um, and, and making sure that also, one of the things I've done is with the clients I'm working with is I've pushed the training. I mean, there's probably bits of software you've got in your business or training things they could be doing. And on furlough, you're allowed to ask them to do training. They are allowed to do training. And so while people are on furlough, you should be giving them things to train on as well, because probably they're bored senseless as well. Um, so it's about making sure you, you're training. And the other bit is about finding and recruiting the right people. When you're a great leader, you attract people in. Right now, there's going to be a glut of people that, that are available to you. So if you position your business right, and I've got you know another client who's got a £1.8 million bank of business coming up, and he's like, I'm going to need to take on more people. This has generated me more work than I had before. And um, so now you've got the opportunity to retain the right people. Great leadership keeps the people that you want and it expels the people that you don't want. Yeah. So obviously we've got to keep the great talent to help us carry on working with those key working jobs and getting out there again and keep it going. So the challenge I see is what a big one around leadership and people don't normally focus on it. So if you haven't focused on it, how are you going to be any better at it? It's just what you've naturally got. So I do suggest, by the way, if you've got pen and paper, everybody, that you, 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 you know, or write notes as you go today, because you'll get ideas out of this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sharing with you good stuff. So it's good to see you interacting. And we can also interact. If you've got questions, you can chuck them up on the chat. Ian, if you keep an eye on the chat for me, that'd be brilliant as well. Um, then we've got cash flow. So cash flow is king. So right now, how are you securing cash from the customers? Are you making sure you've got contracts in? Are you making sure your contracts are being honoured? Are you working on how the going back to work program is going to work? Have you agreed on the, the payment terms and all the rest of it? Because right now, it's a new normal. It's changed. Anything you add in place, it's probably been turned on its head. So you need to go back and make sure everything's renegotiated. You've got the cash agreed. You know when it's coming. You've got your cash flow forecast. Um, the other thing you've got to look at is where are you getting cash injections from? Has anybody gone out there and managed to get a cash injection yet? So has anybody out there managed to get their bounce back loan yet? I've got mine. Has anybody else gone out there and got a, yeah. So, you know, go out there and get the cash injection. So you've got it and you can sit on it. It's better to be in your account, even if you don't need it. So you've got it to use it if you do need it than if you don't need it. And when you suddenly do need it, it could be trouble. So, there are the Sybils loans, the bounce back loans. Um, make sure you're getting the, uh, the tax things. Make sure you're collecting in your furlough payments, all that kind of stuff, getting in the cash. And the other area of challenge I see is around making sure you're properly monitoring it on a proper cash flow forecast. And I'll share one of them with you in a little while, but it's make sure you've got a proper cash flow forecast. And then the last bit is the challenge around communication. So how are you communicating with people? Are you communicating internally in the right way? So what channels of communication have you got to your team? You know, is it a WhatsApp, a Slack group? Is it, are you doing Zoom calls? You know, what other things are you actually doing to, to manage uh, your team? Um, are you uh, taking away that time uh, to talk? You know, because what happens is if you're not doing that one-to-one -one or uh, and then group meetings with your team, they're going to remember you just kind of cast them out there and left them to float by themselves on an ocean, not show where they're going. Right. So you've got to keep them close, let them know you're where they're at and lots of communication. You can't almost, you can't over communicate. 
Um, obviously, um, you've got to enforce your own health and safety regulations that are going to come up. So you've got to communicate them. Clearly, the world has changed. Has everyone redone all their RAMs for their COVID-19 policies now? Everyone done that? Show of hands? Yeah. A voice? Yeah. 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 Because you've got to make sure that they're adopting the new, what is it going to be like in the new normal? How are they operating with distancing? What masks have they got? What gloves have they got? When are they wearing it? How are they sanitizing? What's happening? And you've got to have that clearly defined. How are they approaching people's homes? What are they doing if they've got to go in homes? What are they doing if they've got to go into businesses? So you've got to get your health and safety policies absolutely nailed down and up to date as well. And interestingly, if, when you start going back to the office, I went on health and safety the other day. They said, you've got to run your showers for five minutes because any showers could have built up Legionnaire's disease if you've just leave them and run all the cold water taps as well so that the fresh water comes through the standing pipes and all that stuff. So when you come back, the simple things like that you can do. Just get the desks <coughs> cleaned down. There's a bomb thing that you can get and light uh, and it kind of it explodes chemical everywhere and you leave it for 15, 20 minutes. It just helps um cleanse the whole air if you've got people coming back to the offices because you've got to basically show and demonstrate that you are doing everything you can do on your health and safety as well and then obviously you've got to communicate with customers to make sure that the pipeline is building what work needs to be done when how are we going to track it in the new normal are you able to bring on new clients are you able to use this time to network go on linkedin make new connections find new opportunities that's what i'm doing you know, let's face it, most of you guys on this call, I don't know. So we're out there making new relationships as well. It doesn't mean you've got to make sales right now, but it means you've got to make new relationships and start building opportunities as well. So they're the three key areas and obviously making sure you're keeping to the HSC guidelines, which are constantly being updated as well. So that you're doing the right stuff and agreeing your programs of work. That's what most of my clients have had to do. They've had to renegotiate their, their um, terms of work. So, We've got a, a case study here. Um, as you can see, there's Paul, which is uh, on there. There's a couple of videos. There's Mark from Elm Electrical. Uh, he's gone from 150K to 750K in a year. He just told me last week he quoted over 400K's worth of work in the space of four days. So he's flying now. Doug Wadey, he's gone from 2.7 <coughs> to over 6.5 million working with me. Uh, and then Paul can tell you what he's done in a moment. And the, you'll see that. Do you guys, any of you listen to the Electrician's podcast from Schneider Electric? Is anybody in there? Have you heard of it? No. So they, they, they do the Electrician's podcast. So they interviewed all three of us the other day. Um, and it's available on the Electrician's podcast. And I'll remember shortly. Um, or Ian, if you go to my LinkedIn page and look about five or six posts ago, you'll see that there is a, a link if you share that, um, click through to that link, and you'll go to the electrician's podcast page, then cut and paste that link and stick it in the chat for me. That'd be brilliant. Um, so yeah, the electrician's podcast, it's a new one they've launched. They've got six or seven people that have done it and they asked me to, to do a talk on there about how coaching's help businesses. And these guys came on and for 45 minutes, they talked about the results they've had in their business. So as I said, Doug's grown a, pretty amazing team and he, he's gone from 2.7 to 6.5 million now um mark he's a small business but he's growing his team at some point last year he had over 17 people on on the books um probably about seven of them are his own and the rest of them were subbies um and then uh, i've got paul paul can you give him like a one minute rather than me playing the video because it doesn't work playing a video on this can you tell him a bit about our journey and what some of the things we covered in the last couple of years that's really helped you yeah yeah can do um i was an electrician i trained as an engineer worked on the tools ended up doing a management buyout with a company that i worked for the two guys that owned it previous to me had wanted to retire um put all that together at the age of about 25 Grew the business from like a million pound turnover with about 12 guys to turning over two and a half, three million pounds with about 25, 30 guys. Um, kind of lost my way with it, really. Being an engineer background, I wasn't a businessman. My wife is an accountant, but she's not a financial director. I didn't really understand sales and marketing. It's kind of been an organic growth that then got to a point where 
it, I'd lost control of it and I didn't understand company culture and I didn't understand the cash gap and I didn't understand the requirement for social media. And I actually decided that it was probably the best thing to do to sell the business and get out of it. Went through a few options, came across the concept of coaching, which I'd never even heard of. Uh, did a bit of research in it, came across Emerson and basically jumped into coaching with two feet. Um, me and Emerson did one-to-one -one coaching for probably 18 months where we spoke weekly, we met fortnightly, we were doing three-hour one-to-one sessions uh, and we basically went through every single aspect of my business, whether it be my personal development, the development of our team, the development of software, marketing, rebranding, um, cash flow, the whole thing. And it was an absolute whirlwind for 18 months. The, the guys that work for guys and girls that work for me just thought I'd lost my head. They thought I'd sort of found a mecca and I was changing everything we did daily. It took me a long, empathy was one of the biggest things I learned. It took me a long time to work out that they don't automatically believe what I believe. Just because I thought it was a good idea and the right thing to do, it took six months, a year to get some of them on board. And basically we restructured major parts of the business, um, which then enabled it to stabilize. We've got an incredibly good foundation now. Um, we, we could grow, if it wasn't for this whole COVID thing, we'd be turning over five million pounds this year. I mean, during the COVID situation in the last two months, I've developed two new customer bases. And I mean, a customer to me can be worth half a million, a million pounds a year. Normally we get one a year, but because we've been going and we know what we're doing with social media now and the contact and our message to customers now is so consistent and the guys that work for us are so consistent delivering it, the customers are coming to us automatically. It, it's, it's a great place to be in, but it took a lot of hard work and a lot of change. I mean, my management team, Amazon knows, was five people. Out of those five people, when we started, two of them are no longer there. That's senior management. I mean, one of the guys I had to buy off to get him out of the company. Half of the engineers have now changed. But what you find is, like Emerson says, if you know what you're doing and you structure yourself and you structure your message, the people that want that seek you out and they find you. And you, it just bolsters up your team. So you get rid of, rid of the people that are sitting on the fence and just out for themselves or or don't understand what's going on and you retain the people that do and then you attract more that do and before you know where you are you're in a situation now where for example right now i'm working four hours a day that's it i've got a team back in the office of four i've got 25 engineers back out on the road and everybody knows what they're doing that the communication is there through slack i've got no pressures no no problems the cash flow system works me and my wife works from home. She's doing two or three hours a day and we're just running a business that's still going to turn over three million pounds this year. And I'm now building the pipeline for next year. I mean, I don't want to big you up too much, Emerson, but what <laughs> that is, bit late for that. is peace of mind. It's <clears throat> the best way to put it to me is Emerson told me once, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. If, if you haven't got the box, if you can't see the picture, you're just struggling and trying to find pieces and that doesn't fit, that doesn't fit. What Emerson does is kind of give you a picture and then you work out the way to do it. And, and once you've got that confidence, it fills down to the team around you. It fills down to your customers and they want to be part of it. And it just, honestly, it makes going to work a joy. So thank you, Emerson. Thank you very much, mate. Appreciate that. Uh, I really do. Um, right now, I wipe the tear from my eye, and uh, I'll carry on. Um, no, thanks, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate you coming on, volunteering, you know, of your time today to come on and and share with the guys to give them a bit of inspiration as well. Because it's easy for me to say, "Oh, you just got to do this, that, and the other," but actually, it's more important when you see other people are doing it too. Okay. So the next step uh, is all about the uh, the actual model. So this is the this is the the jigsaw puzzle that uh, we gave to Paul and showed him the box. Um, and then I like to say we shine a light on it, yeah, with uh, our bright business light, so we can show you what you need to do. And so you, you sort of share this model. Now, um, hopefully, did everyone get an email with a copy of the model? Has everyone seen a copy? Can you show hands? Yeah, 
yeah good man good man so you got a copy of it so today i'm only picking little elements of it but obviously we've got the full picture there today we're just doing the corners really and a few bits down the down the edge if we if we're lucky um but leadership management is all about that's the way it works is like a system all the pieces have to work together and that's what people forget with a business so i think of my system as being like the leadership management is like the head it's where you've got your eyes for your vision for where you want to go your ears for your empathy for listening and understanding the market and understanding your team your mouth for expressing and communicating the messages you want to give out most importantly your brain for making decisions and uh, one could say that leadership and management are separated with just that dotted line between the two. They're quite closely linked. I'd like to think of it as kind of like left brain logic and right brain emotion. So your leadership is your emotion and your connection and your management is your logic and your, and your business structure. So they're the two areas of the head and they're like the keystone. All of that bit holds everything together. And if you get that right, your business is a direct reflection of how good that keystone is in your business. And that's what we work on first. I usually go into people's business and they're like, oh, I want to add more clients. Or as Paul's case, he said, I don't want any more clients. I want to fix the business. But, you know, you, you, most people go, I want more clients or whatever. I'm like, hang on a minute. Before we do that, we need to work on you, get you right because then your business will be a reflection of who you are. And however your business is right now, it's a reflection, direct reflection of you. So we need to make you the best you you can be. And then you can tune the business around that. And then we work on finance, which is like the torso, basically. It's where the food goes in and converts to energy in a body. And in your business, the products and services go in and they convert to cash. And like anything with finance, you have to deal with a bit of crap as well so that's the that's the finance part then you've got your your legs your hr and your operations they're the things that carry the business forward so depending on how strong your legs are depends on whether you can run a marathon or just hobble down the steps you know so we've got to build strength in your legs some businesses i meet they're just hopping they're like what's this hr thing they're not even doing it they're just hopping along one legged wondering why it's so difficult or they're dragging it behind them because it's broken yeah or the operations are limping along because it's like you know the bits are, aren't fitting together properly and the jigsaw isn't properly built and they're, they're trying to ram pieces in that are the wrong shape and all the rest of it so we make sure we take each part apart it's a bit like taking a gearbox apart realigning everything reorganizing it putting it back in changing any pieces that aren't working and we make it work better and i'd love to say it's a quick fix but none of this is a quick fix. It is a long-term piece of work, isn't it, Paul? You know, you just have to go at it, and, and it's lots of little bits. There isn't really one big thing that changes everything, apart from the culture, but that is built up of lots of little pieces that change. Everything is lots of little pieces. If you're building a building, you know, it's like building it a brick at a time, and that's what we do. Then you've got the, the arms, which is marketing and sales. And they're the things that grab the opportunities as opportunities go by. You use your arms to grab them. Now, I don't know if anyone's been to a climbing wall before, but one of my clients was Clip and Climb Cambridge. He was an old friend of mine, and he asked me to coach him. And we helped him coach his business. And climbing a climbing wall one-handed is really bloody difficult. And yet so many businesses I meet are doing that. They're either doing a bit of sales, but no, really no marketing or doing a bit of marketing, but nobody's closing a barn door. So we've got to use both and make sure they work together in unison. And then the whole thing is like your body and your uh, everything working together. If you're scaling that mountain or climbing that mountain, using your arms, your legs, everything together. And when you run a whole business, that's what we should be doing, running the whole business. There's a great book called The E-Myth I um, often recommend to my clients. So if you wanted to read a good book uh, or audio while you're off right now, The E-Myth talks about most business owners who start a business, you think that they could be entrepreneurs because you've got the entrepreneurs, the technicians and the managers. Most people who start a business, what do you think they are? Entrepreneurs, technicians or managers? What do you reckon, guys? Technicians, I expect. Well, that's a good guess. Who said that? Yeah, well done. They are. Most people are technicians, but everyone thinks you've got to be an entrepreneur. You're not. Most of them are technicians, i.e. if you're an electrical contractor, you start an electrical contracting business. If you're a hairdresser, you start a hairdressing business. You start as the operator. And unfortunately, most people get stuck in the operations and don't take themselves out. And therefore, they don't do the management part. And they definitely don't do the entrepreneurial part. Whereas what I do is I come along and kind of support you doing the bits you're most uncomfortable with. Now, I can't teach you how to wire a plug better 
you can do that bit but what we can do is we can put a program in place that teaches your guys how to fit a um a fuse board in a better way how to do it the way you want it because often you'll find that you have a really high standard and then you start employing people and the standards can drop off has anyone found that happen before yeah yeah so yeah. what we've got to do is make sure that people keep to your standards right you set the standards and i help you support that but i don't go in there and say look this is how you wire it up better that's not my thing if any of you guys want to have a three hour session with me i'm happy to go through anything you need to that's why we're doing these strategy sessions off the back of this and we'll deep dive deep into whatever you need in those sessions right my job is to get you thinking differently because if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you've always got so what we will do is if you want to change what you've got right now, you're going to have to change the way you think. Um, I think that's probably one of the big things that happened with you with audio books, wasn't it, Paul? We changed your perception, your thinking, would you say? Of Definitely. where, you, where your, your perception of the world has changed, isn't it? Yeah, the, the audio books was a huge supplement to the, the coaching content that me and you did. I mean, having left school at 16, I never read a book until I was... 33 again, 34, uh, the start of Emerson. And I think over the last couple of years, I've probably, I say read, listened to, probably getting on to 50 now, whether they be autobiographies by people like Jack Welsh or learning or specific tasks, whatever it is, the, the book, listening to stuff on Audible is amazing. Absolutely. And I'm telling you, this book, Paul, you're right. That book, Essentialism, I am properly loving that. Craig yeah. McEwen essentialism uh i've got 44 minutes left it's absolutely awesome it's about you know whittling everything down in your business life so you just focus on that which is the most important and and cut out all the crap basically it was a really brilliant book so highly recommend that one um so uh so here we go all right so the um seven sector model here we go i'm going to dive into leadership in a crisis so leadership in a crisis, basically you've got to take control of your business as a leader. It's you and your business. Often people think of their business as a thing, but it's actually you as well. Everything you do, everybody looks at. And so they perceive, you know, like Richard Branson and Virgin, they're kind of like, there's a perception isn't there about him and about his business. You as the business leader, there is a perception of you and your business. So you have to work on your own leadership skills as well as working on making the business deliver the best way it can. So it starts with your success mindset. And so now's a great time to reevaluate that because I mean, people like Gavin in my business, you know who, who yep. he was and what he was doing. At the time, I thought it was fantastic. Technically, it was really good. He's one of my senior managers. He left the company at Christmas, and everything instantly got better because he was in, he was technically brilliant, but he was negative. Yeah. You know, we've all had a break for I don't know how many weeks, and everything's in, in a state of flux right now. So now is a good time to reevaluate those people that are around you because you only really see it in retrospect. When you're in the moment and living and busy and day to day and cracking on, you don't notice somebody bringing you down or holding you back or acting like an anchor. But now you've broke that cycle. Now is a great time to, to actually reevaluate the people that are around you. Because that's one of the biggest things for me is getting the right people around you. Oh, the right people is, is key. You know, any team that's successful, it comes down to the people who are in that team and how they work together. You know, you'll find that there are teams that technically haven't got the best people in, but they will. Uh, create better um they will create better output uh than um than you know people who are just um great individuals i mean you could put someone like pele the best football player in the world you know some would say or any of those sorts of players put them on a football pitch and then have them try and play against the whole of another team they're never going to win so individuals on their own aren't the pl it's the team and how the team works together that is really important. Just having amazing individuals, even like your guy, highly skilled individuals, if they're not want to be part of the team and play as part of a team, it still doesn't help you support your goals and achieving your, uh, your goals for your business, does it? So here's the thing. Let's say you've got to recruit some new people right now. And you lose a few and you've got to recruit some more. So do you want to recruit people with what I'd say a bad attitude where they're 
blaming other people, they're antagonistic and they're defensive. Or do you want to have a great attitude where they're gracious, responsible, enthusiastic, accountable and team working? What do we want? Bad attitude or great attitude? Call out for me, people. What do we want? Bad or great? It's got to be great, surely. Right. Yeah. We want a great attitude. Brilliant. Absolutely. So let's think. Who is the first employee in the company that you're in? Self. Think about it. Who? Yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yourself. So first thing you need to think about is what do I put out to the outside world? Am I blaming everything, blaming other people? Am I antagonistic? Am I defensive about things? Or am I gracious? Am I responsible? Am I enthusiastic? Am I accountable? Am I playing as part of a team? So the reflection of your business, I said a reflection of you, and you will attract in, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So first we have to do is work on yourself and think about how you are operating, because that's going to attract in the people who are like you are. And um, so are you your first employee? Do you have that right attitude? And I, really, recruitment comes to me, uh, attitude first, skill second. So you're looking for people with the right attitude. As you said, you might have people in your business right now who are skillful, but if they haven't got the right attitude, they'll be, they'll be anchors holding your business back. And that's anchors with an A, everybody, um, holding you back, right? <clears throat> okay, so the next thing to think about is your RAS. So how do we, if you're, if you may have a tendency to be slightly negative, and that's okay, because I'm going to explain to you why that is, and then how we reprogram you, because everybody's got a RAS, a reticular activating system. Um, can I ask, who knows what the RAS is, other than Paul? Does anybody know what a RAS is, your reticular activating system? Anybody know? No? Right, I'll explain it to you then. So we share the screen. Yep, here we go again. What you focus on is what you was what you notice. All right. So you can either set things, you can set them positively up here, or you can set things negatively. Some people uh, they don't know it's been set. It can be set by your family, by your friends, by your schooling, by your education, by all sorts of stuff. You know, some things are set negatively, and and that's okay because sometimes they're a safety mechanism. So for negative things, I'd be thinking like. Um, some people will always tell you that it rains on a bank holiday. Have you noticed that? Some people who, who always thinks it rains on a bank holiday. Because I can tell you the Ooh. other way, <laughs> that beautiful sunny one. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, if it rains on a bank holiday that you notice, you will go there. See, I told you. And you'll continue to reinforce your view. Right. Over and over again. Now, what I did is one day I just went, you know what? I'm going to check this out. And I started looking. And do you know what? The more I've looked the more I've noticed that it is sunny on a bank holiday because I notice it. And that's when it's sunny, I'm like, ah, that's the case. So whatever you set your filters for and whether you've practically set them and noticed them or not, they are your goals. And that's what you need to do. You need to set your filters. Now, what I do is I come along, give people a great big kick in their ass is what I say. And we reset your filters because they've been set for you by people that may not even be qualified to set them for you. They've just set them. And along through your life, you can probably only manage about 15 or so filters at any one time. And, and that's when you set your focus. So what we do is when we do the coaching, we go back and we set all your filters with these goals. We set goals for your business. Now, sometimes, and I run a, a goal management system called Smartsheet. It's like our planning system. I'd love to say that Paul was diligently looking at it every week or every day. I'm sure you weren't, Paul. I don't even know if you, I can't see you on the screen at the minute. I'm sure you probably weren't looking at it every day. But once you'd set the goals, they're in your mind anyway, aren't they? Yeah, I missed that. Sorry, mate. I went to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying about when you set your ass, you set your goals. Yeah. And what happens is if you set your goals, even though you might not be looking at your smart sheet every single day, and updating it like I'd love you to. But when you go back to have a look at it every couple of weeks, you're like, oh, oh, I've done that. Yeah. And the reason you did that is you set it in your mind as something you wanted to get done and you just knew you need to get on and do it. We just kind of set all the goals in a smart sheet as a way of managing the project. 
is a project management software. That's what I use. Um, but if you haven't got the goal set, you'll just be floating around doing anything you want. I mean, let me put it this way. If you don't set your goals and set it all into a plan, how many of you would go on and try and quote a job? Say you're quoting, I don't know, a half million pound decent sized job, right? And somebody doesn't give you any drawings and any plans. And they say, give us a quote. How the hell could you do that? You couldn't, did you? And let's say you, you were building an extension on the side of your house. You wouldn't say to somebody, to the builder, just turn up and plan it. Oh, I'll just turn up, build it every day. However you want, mate, we'll be fine. We'll work on it every day. You wouldn't. You'd have a set of architect drawings, wouldn't you, that shows you what you're expecting to build. And that's what we do right at the beginning. That strategic session that I do with people, in that strategy session, we architect your plan, not my plan, your plan, and we make sure you sit down and focus on what goals you want, and that's how we go about getting them installed and done. So, right, so this is why you need to have written goals. Most people go along through life without a proper written business plan. Would you agree? I'm sure you know lots of small business owners. Uh, I'm not asking you to look in the mirror right now, but let's just think about how detailed and organized your business plan is, right? And there's, a, there's an example where there's somebody with no written goals, no verbal goals. This is the Harvard Business School where they, had, uh, uh, they did a test on this class. 13% of them had verbal goals. 3% had written goals. The results of that test 25 years later is these people had twice the earnings of everybody else because they had a verbal goal. They knew where they wanted. So they were setting their RAS, but they were setting it verbally in their mind. And they say that the strongest ink is, uh, sorry, the weakest ink is stronger than the strongest thought, given that these guys now got 10 times the earnings because they had a written plan. So by having that written plan, I wouldn't say the written plan made all the things happen, did it, Paul? But by having a written plan, you had something to get done, didn't you? Or okay. some goals to achieve and things to do. It keeps you on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's only there to try and keep you on track. So that's a bit about having goals and the reason it's so powerful and important to do that. The next thing I want to start talking about is your own leadership skills. So I recommend this book to five levels of leadership. Now, it is a pretty heavy book, to be fair. So you probably want to start with some lighter ones. Um, but I'm going to take you through the model. So I think it's really powerful. Um, maybe on leadership, there's a great book called It's Your Ship. I recommend that one quite a lot for, for, for a, an easy way in on leadership. Um, it's about a guy who turns around... Um, uh, um, Michael D. Arbuschoff, he go, goes on and takes a boat on in the Navy and he turns it into the best performing ship in the Navy in an 18 month period. Um, this one here, John Maxwell, I think his stuff's awesome, really powerful, pretty deep, quite heavy if it was your first audio book, I'd say. But this is the model that we've created that he uses. First thing is positional leadership. Now, what you'll find is positional leadership is where you put somebody in a position of leadership, but they're not necessarily a leader at that point. They think they are, but they're not. You just see the potential in them being a leader. So positional leadership is only the first step of leadership. Now you might notice if you make one of your guys from an engineer to maybe a team leader, they'll start going around bossing people about and saying, hey, I'll go get my coffee, you know, go get me a bacon roll, go get my tools out of the van and all that stuff. That is not good leadership, but they think that's what leadership is, right? So that's the first step of leadership. The second step of leadership is understanding that actually until you get permission to be their leader, they ain't going to be listening to you. So you've got to build relationships. It's all about building the relationships and making friends with them and understanding where, you know, understanding what drives them and empathy and connection. When they know you care about them, they'll care about you. And they won't in any other way. Yeah, so they, they, they need to know how much you care about them before they'll start caring about you. Right. So you've got to understand them and get part of that. And it, this is like the glue that holds the whole piece together, because the next step is all about getting great results. But you can't get great results if you do it on your own. There's a, another good book out there if you're interested in, in coaching. This guy, Sir John Whitmore, he uh, he's like well, the granddaddy of coaching. He came up with the grow model. It's like a really well-known 
coach's model. Anyway, he was coaching a team of um, people. I think there's like 17 of them on this team. And they have to disem uh, take apart a cannon, move the cannon over an obstacle course, and then rebuild the cannon. And it's been going like 200 years, this thing. And it's got to the point, almost like the four-minute mile, that it's, it's, it's as quick as it can be. It's like 12 minutes, something or other. And it's, it's like, you know, nobody can get it any quicker. And what he did, he came in and coached his team. And the way they normally do it is they have a captain who's in charge and he tells everybody what to do. And in their training, he says, do that a bit quicker, lift that fit faster, do this a bit better, right? And he's using a very management technique. That's like management. Management is about telling people, pick up that glass, move that glass over there. What he does is he goes into a coaching mode. And he says, right, I want you all to be on the same level, all 17 of you. I don't want one head. I want 17 heads all working together to come up with the best ways to move this cannon and so for six months, they're testing and training and somebody go, oh, if you move that, do you notice if you move that, that makes it better over that way. And they're, they're all working together to do it. Anyway, the upshot is they come to this competition and they come in and they enter this competition. And by, <coughs> by the way, people have been beating this record by a second or two seconds. They come in and smash it by two minutes. It completely blows everyone's brains. And the point is, he says 17 heads are better than one. So in your business, don't try and be the only head. Get other people working with you. You know, you're not the only head. Yes, you drive it, I guess, Paul, in your business, but you get influence from other people and you get them to share their ideas and what they're thinking. You're now an open book instead of just saying, do it my way or the highway, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is where you get great results, but you have to have brought the team with you. If you don't bring the team with you, it's just you bossing people about and you would suffer and it'll be hard to get great results. And then finally, the job of a leader is to build other leaders. Find other people. So think about your cousin, Ash. I remember at that barbecue, he said to me, he started listening to books, didn't he, on his way over to Nottingham and back, Paul. And he was like just crunching through book after book. He'd never heard of audio books before. You know, he's naturally stepped up now and become one of your sort of leaders in the business, isn't he? One of your sort of team leaders or something, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he's now sitting in a management meeting. His next step for him is ops director. Yeah, exactly. His, within a year, he'll be there. Yeah. And so your job as a leader is now to find the people who've got that spark and then you nurture it, you know, and you nurture that spark into the flames of leadership and build that up. So your job as a great leader is to go around looking up and building tiers of leadership. That's what my job is now. My job is to go around and find other coaches that could be great coaches for Bright and become great coaches for even more people. That's what we're looking to do. And at the fifth level is the pinnacle, which is where you're respected by other people and you don't know who they are. So, for example, people like Gandhi, you know, um, Richard Branson, um, uh, Nelson Mandela, all that stuff. They're like recognized as great leaders. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe one day if we do enough webinars, you know, people start hearing about me and what we're doing. But until then, I'll worry about that later. But the pinnacle is where you're at the top and people know who you are because of the work that you're doing, basically. Um, so that is the five levels of leadership. And I highly recommend listening to the book. Really helps you understand how to become a great leader. Emotional intelligence. So if first you've got to develop your leadership skills and recognize you know, ways that you can uh, be a better leader. Um, the other thing is to work on yourself. And um, I use this model. Some of you might have heard of BGL Group. They own Compare the Market and stuff like that. So I've been and done uh, a most intelligence training with Dr. Martin Newman from Roche Martin, the only person I know who's actually got three PhDs. Um, and he coaches basically people like Sky, ExxonMobil, Rolls-Royce, Boeing, the top huge businesses, because they know they need emotional intelligence development. They've got HR directors that have told them all of that and they're working on it, right? The smaller businesses that I work with, the SME businesses, haven't probably even heard of emotional intelligence. Anyone heard of emotional intelligence on here before? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So emotional intelligence um, is basically the way that you treat other people. Um, and your emotional intelligence is about how you make other people feel and are you sensing how they're feeling? Um, it's stuff that is, um, they say IQ you know, is like your intelligence level, how smart you are, but your EQ is your ability to get on and work with other people. And they know that the people who are most successful in life have got the highest levels of EQ, 
rather than IQ. You have to have enough IQ to get in the game, but your EQ is what's much more important about the way you, you get on with other people. You'll often find that somebody's reached the technical level of maybe like an IT director or something like that. And they're like the most technical person, but they're usually the least technical in the department. And that's because they've got the best people skills and they're running the people, not running the technical in-depth pieces of work. So emotional intelligence, if you're going to be a great leader, it's about having first self-awareness. It's about having the emotional intelligence to be able to actually look in the mirror, having the courage, I'd say, to look in the mirror. I'm just going to put my nice new fan on. Can anybody hear that fan? It's supposed to be silent running. Is it good? No? Oh, good. I've just made it a little bit cooler. Um, so the emotional intelligence is about that mirror, um, looking in the mirror and going, what do I see inside myself? If anger comes up for reasons, why is it coming up? If sadness comes up for reasons, why does it come up? If happiness comes up, why does it come up? And start looking at where the emotions are coming from and what drives those emotions. So start looking into yourself and looking in the mirror. Um, the next thing then is to look at your self-management. And that is about how you broadcast what's going on inside your head to the outside world. That's your physical behavior. Um, you know, are you confident um, or are you, you know, broken down? In this situation, I've met people who are a bit lower and broken down. Yeah, you know, are you self-reliant? Do you have the ability to stand on your own two feet? Are you self-controlled? I'm working on teaching my youngest one self-control because mm. he goes crazy. And even though I've told him this morning, please be quiet, he still went shouting down the stairs a moment ago. Yeah, because he needs to learn self-control. And I think that the art of self-control really comes from the ability to listen and be able to listen to other people so you know when to hold back in. And that's been one of my, my development areas myself personally. So it's about working on your self-control. Then you've got to work on your social awareness. Your social awareness is about your ability to understand other people, to walk in their shoes, to connect and understand and get empathy. Now, believe it or not, the most important trait in leadership is empathy being able to connect with your people because when you can connect to your people they'll come with you to the edge of the earth and back they'll do whatever right so once you've learned that skill i'll see paul smiling because that's something that we've both worked on mate don't worry <laughs> i've had to work on it myself as well um i remember doing that ecr we did that 360 on me and yeah empathy was like five percent not, not a lot of ink on the page was it <laughs> yeah basically yeah. you get a report that gives you 10 areas these 10 areas and you get a 360 which gets other people to fill it in there's nothing like an ecr 360 for breakfast to show you who's really saying what about you and you really because it's a completely confidential tool but you get to learn and you get insight it's like one of them 360 mirrors people go in and they're like oh my god you know is that what i really look like and then they they understand <laughs> what it's all about the next step is then your social skills, is your ability to network. And they say your network is your net worth. Your ability to network and connect with other people is your net worth. If I think about some of the clients I've picked up, they have happened. One of my largest clients I've picked up, Chilton Cold Storage, 12 million turnover business, happened because of my network. I'm on a trustees board for Little Miracles. The guy who's uh, the partner for Safri Champney, he's a big accountancy practice in Peterborough, is on the trustees board. We ran one of these workshops in his offices because of our networking and doing that together. And off the back of that, I picked up a really big client. It happens because of your network the people you know. Right now, I'm currently the online partner for the Chamber of Commerce in Cambridgeshire, developing their online programs for them, doing online networking and online events, because I stepped up and used my network and went and spoke to them. So those things is about your network. And then finally, it's about your ability to adapt and be flexible, and also to have optimism. Optimism is one of them key traits where it's not about being all really happy. It's about being able to pick yourself up and dust yourself down from a difficult thing and carry on going. So right now, those of us who got knocked down a bit, can we stand back up again and can we get going again? Can we come off the ropes and come back? It's about failing forward, learning from any failures and things that are going wrong. And what do we need to do to move forward again? So that adaptability, that self uh, vision for where you're going, having a big vision, it will help give you something to aim at and keep you going. So that's what we do on emotional intelligence. We work on yourself and developing you. Clearly that's just an overview, but, 
And for those of you who got a copy of the Orbit out right now, um, this is what I call level one in personal leadership. It's about getting organized. So what does your room look like? Is it like the one on the left before or is it like the one on the world after? Because the essentialists would work in the one after. Having a clear desk so you can see what you're doing and you're organized. Yeah, and I understand both desks because I've owned both of them in my life. Um, but it's about, you know, having that or getting organized and focusing on the tasks. What tasks do you need to do? So one of my clients, Bonachia, they created these sheets. So that everyone in their business had a list of their top three things that they needed to do that day. And what was the one thing that's most important that they needed to do over and above anything else? So that's what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to write down your list of tasks and know what's important so you can focus on getting it done. Remember, the weakest ink is stronger than the strongest thought. So I teach people to use uh, a, a, a task management system. So you can either use a, a paper-based one like this, like they did, or you can use an electronic one. And I tend to use to-do myself, but there's to-do, there's Trello, there's Asana, there's Monday.com. There's loads of different ones out there. Um, I know that my coach uses Trello, um, but I like to use smart sheets and to-do. Mm -hmm. So to do is like my daily management of things that I need to do. And the reason I like that is part of Microsoft package. So who's using Microsoft 365 in their business? Anybody using Microsoft 365? Then you probably get it as part of it. Prioritizing them. I'm going to show you how to prioritize in a minute. And then organize your time. Think about your calendar as being the most important asset in terms of what you can do. Because with time, you can't get it back again. So the people who have got the highest levels of performance, it's what choices they make of their time and where they spend it. And getting ruthless with your time is one of the most important things you can do to organize and energize yourself because you focus on what's important and you get that done other than just working on, you know, bits and pieces being drawn into this and drawn into that. You know, you can't, if you've got it in, your, you know, I know I can't be drawn into doing something else right now because I'm focusing on developing and delivering this webinar. Right. So there's a chap out there, a guy called Stephen Covey, and he's written a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, he uses this model that I'm going to show you now, but he's put it in a quadrant. Uh, I've put it into a triangle because for me, this is the order you need to think of it in. As in at the bottom, you have the not urgent, not important stuff. So what on earth is not urgent, not important, but we still do it in our in our business lives is anybody who, who could think of what's what, what things are distraction do we get distracted by can i have some feedback can you turn your mics on talk to a friend talking to a friend absolutely having social a chat media. in the daytime social media social media is good if you start with a means and what you're focusing on doing and getting it done but somehow you end up looking at a cat playing a piano that's a bad thing right <laughs> so um, yeah, distraction. So stuff like some phone calls, you know, if you're chatting with your family and friends during the day when you should be working, then that's going to mean that you get distracted. You know, some bits of social media are going to be a distraction. Escape activities, you know, this having boundaries is really important right now. So you get up and go to work. I get up, go to work, put this T-shirt on, even though I'm at home. I know I'm at work. This is what I'm doing. I'm at work because otherwise you can stay in your PJs and watch TV all day. Now, none of us, I'm sure have done that on this, but you know, there are those people on, you know, furlough and not working for you as hard as they could at the minute who are probably doing that, staying in the in their PJs all day and watching telly. Um, some chatting and gossiping, chatting with the neighbors, gossiping, you know, two meters distance, of course, but you know, that sort of stuff is okay, but it will can distract you from what you need to get done. Some pointless routines or the other thing, no routine. You know, I ran my club already this morning, at eight o'clock. We still run it every Tuesday and every Thursday. I've got clubs that I run, uh, that are geographical clubs and we're doing it online. I ran my Northampton club this morning, at eight o'clock. I was still up and at it and working and getting on it. So having that boundaries is really important. So that's distraction. Then we've got delusion. So that is urgent, but not important. We call it delusion. What on earth could be urgent, but not important? And have some, some ideas. What do you think it could be? Dave, what do you reckon? What could be urgent, but not important? 
when somebody says it, no hurry on the quote take your time and i'll have it whenever yeah it could be that but i'm saying they're saying it's urgent that's when they phone up and go i need it tomorrow morning mm. but they don't really need it for two weeks yeah. or it could be something that's urgent not important is what i call other people's crap they come to you and they're like oh i need this spreadsheet filled out really quick oh my god there's no bog roll bit of an emergency there's no toilet roll and you're like well it sounds like an emergency for you not me you know it's and if you go around solving everybody's emergency all the time and this is the biggest mistake business owners make if you are the person at the center of their world who fixes all their problems why are they ever going to go anywhere else why are they ever going to stand on their own two feet? They're going to come to you forever. If you're always answering their questions, if people come to you with questions and you don't push back and go, well, what would you do if I wasn't here? How could you handle it? Because I know full well in my house, I can't say this too loud, but my kids, they just go, mom, mom. And they just shout mom from any room in the house, expecting to have some like automatic servant deliver whatever it is. Where's my hoodie? Mom, where's my thing? What is it? You know, they constantly do that. And unfortunately, sometimes she goes and answers their queries. So now they've learned it's much easier just to shout mum than it is to actually go and figure it out for themselves. Got to be really careful. If you fix everything for your team all the time, you're not actually helping them stand on their own two feet. You want them to stand on their own two feet. So you end up getting dragged into all sorts of crap. So you need to establish boundaries. Get rid of those trivial requests. Just say, sure, we can deal with it later at two o'clock this afternoon. And by then, they'll have hopefully figure it out. And come, or if you say, come back to me with three answers as to why it should be, how it should be, and then see what they have to say. Be careful of the interruptions. So obviously right now I'm doing my best to warn everybody not to interrupt me, but make sure you are in a place. If you've got to focus on a big tender, don't take phone calls. They reckon it takes 15 minutes to get back into the thought processes. Turn your phone off, put it somewhere out of the way, turn the damn email off. Do not have the email dinger on. Has anyone got an email dinger on their laptop while they're sitting there? Emails pop up, turn the email dinger off. It will stop you. You can look at email, but when you've organized to look at email, not just when it's demanded upon you. And also watch out for those apparent emergencies like the missing bog roll. Where is it? You know, um, and those knee jerk panics. Oh no, we need everything to site tomorrow. Why? We're not starting for another week. Oh, cause they said that we needed it. Okay. You know, actually, you know, watch out for those knee jerk panics where people will try and panic you into getting things done. And some meetings, this is delusion. Sometimes you go to a meeting, you know, like, what am I actually here for? I should have bothered to check what I was going to be there for in the first place. So that is that the next bit is what we call the urgent and important. That's demand. Pretty obvious what demand is. That is the shit we got to do. That is crisis management, getting stuff done, dealing with emergencies, complaints, getting orders processed, getting orders done, um, pressing problems, getting your deadlines done, getting your VAT done, getting things organized, getting some meetings. Some meetings are important. You need strategic meetings. You need thinking meetings. You need operational meetings. You need meetings that drive your business forward. And then finally... This is where coaching resides. We call it the not urgent, but important. So congratulations. There was about 25 people who could have been on this today, but I knew there'd always be about a 50% fallout and there always is, right? Because something else came up that was urgent for them and stopped them doing the not urgent, but important stuff. And this is what it's all about. That strategic planning, this reflection time that you're doing right now, this self-development, this developing your skills you're developing your knowledge um, the system development the going around and organizing better processes better systems better way of doing things this is you becoming the mechanic on your business and working on it not in it and that's what i tried to do is take i took paul out of the middle of the orbit and put him on the outside so he can then go around and fix the different parts he needs to you know without being in it all the time and being dragged into things and like it's time for innovation Who's had to innovate? I've had to innovate. We're doing these webinars online now. I normally run it in an event and all the rest of it. I've had to change direction. I'm now doing all my coaching online. It's working out really well, actually. It's even more focused than it is when you meet face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, have you had to innovate? And then the last one is create a timetable diary. If you want to be organized, just think about it. How are kids normally 
in school, how do they know what work to do for homework, what classes to be in, when to bring their PE kit, what is that super powerful time management system that they use? What's it called? Chris, what's it called? Ah, you're not on. You can uh, turn your speakers on. What no, is it? No. Yeah. No, what is it when they're at school? What is it called? They have a school... Timetable. 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 Absolutely. So if you start organising, so if you start organising your diary, this isn't mine, by the way, because I don't do yoga and meditation at six in the morning. Um, but you know, you start organising your diary with colours and what needs to be done, and start blocking things out. You know, what repeat meetings do you need to have? Like a timetable, so you're much more organised with what to do with your time. It gives you time and boundaries, and also the most important thing is if you've got tasks that need to be done, most people take the tasks off their task list and don't put them in their calendar. If you take a task off your task list and put it in your calendar because you've got to get it done, that's how you get it done. Yeah, because my business, Bright, I've set our vision. We want to create a 1,000 millionaires from 100 coaches over the next 10 years. That's my big goal. I want to create a 1,000 millionaires from 100 coaches over the next 10 years. So, I mean, it's crazy. Right? I've got this guy who came onto this webinar from Australia. I just picked up a client in Melbourne, Australia. He's a sparky over there. Praxis, his company is. But he actually really loves all this personal development stuff. And he's one who read books beforehand and everything. And I said, look, one day I'm going to launch in Australia. So let's nail down your business, get you learning how to use the orbit on your business. And then a year later, you could be one of our coaches over in Australia, which would be awesome. So hopefully that'll work. Anyway, so it's about getting that team behind you when they know what the plan is. So in terms of pulling the team to behind you, you've got to get this HR framework in place. You've got to know who are the right people, get the right people on the bus, playing, you know, um, sitting in the right positions. That's the juggle that you need to do. And right now you've got a great opportunity. If you thought, okay, let's say I can sack everybody in my business, which ones am I going to re-employ? In order to do that, you need the right policies. So you need to have policies in place. Think about the well-being of the team. What are you doing for the well-being of the team? How are you connecting with them? How are you doing Zoom meetings? How are you looking after them? But also on that health and safety side, how are you protecting them? What are you doing to make sure they're protected? Make sure you're following the right guidelines, getting the right PPE, all that kind of stuff. How are you doing the travel arrangements? What are you going to do with the furloughs? Have you got a plan for the people on furlough? And how are you going to bring them back? Or what the expectations are going to be? Yeah. How are you going to pay them? 80%, 100%? You're going to drop it back to 60? What's the payment? You know, what's the forecast going to be? And redundancies. What's got to happen? We've got to be real about this. If you use furlough right, you can make redundancies now. And while they're on furlough, that can be living out some of their time on redundancy without you having to bring it back and then make them redundant and cost you more money and wages. So I know that um, HR Solutions, one of the guys I work with, Greg, he's doing a lot of this right now. <coughs> what layoffs are there going to be? So you've got to get the HR right on the negative and the positive, but you also got to develop the culture. If you don't have a strong culture, you know, let's think of one of the strongest cultures, you know, we've all seen the hacker. It's just like, and, uh, it's, it's, it brings the hairs on the back of your neck up. You can feel them all linked together. You want a team who are right, working together, doing that hacker together, that, you know, whatever the hacker is for your business, you know, that brings them together. What are the cultural things that you want people to do? So their culture at Zappos is deliver a wow through service, embrace and drive change, create fun and a little weirdness, be adventurous, creative and open-minded, pursue growth and learning. You can see there's loads of them on there. They're all doing words though, which is really good. This is what we want you to do. Um, I did another one for a client. We came up with their hunger was their one. Honesty, unity, nurturing, growth, excellence and respect. That's what they wanted to use to drive through their business because they were involved in the frozen food industry. So they thought hunger was a brilliant, you know, they want people who are hungry for more. So that was theirs. Paul, what are your three culture points? Do you remember what they are? You can look them up and... I've got a bit of a me. problem if I don't, do not I? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just realised I was going to drop them on you. No, it, uh, we've still only got the three. We never built on that. We've got those three yeah. and they're solid. So it's be honest, helpful, and humble. Consider the other's perspective and take ownership and achieve success. Brilliant. So uh, everything you do, all decisions, all decisions you can make through, your, through, the, through the lens of your culture, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we, last year we um, got that fire and security division set up. 
and I employed a new BBM for the Fire and Security Business Development Manager. He's on 50k plus a year salary and he kept coming to me with odds and sods and questions and how do I do with this and my answer to almost every one was as long as you can honestly say you've abided by those three statements I won't have a problem with whatever you choose. Brilliant. And yeah, it, no, I remember he came to our he came to our last summit. Is it John? Is it? Was it Jonathan? John? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Cool. So brilliant. Thanks for uh, pointing out the culture piece there. Um, but it's so powerful, isn't it? I can't explain to you guys how powerful it is if you get it right. It just everyone just starts rowing together on the boat in the same going together, and it just it just creates that unison. You've seen the guys rowing on the Oxford Cambridge. You know the it's just it looks amazing how they're all pulling together, and that's what happens when you get the culture right. Everyone's pulling together at the same time. Now we're going to talk about cash flow, making sure you got your money. Now we are at twelve thirty nearly, and I can just give you a few hints and tips on cash flow and I can give you a few hints and tips on communication. The most important thing was about getting your leadership and your management and your, your thinking right. But I'm prepared to go on probably another half an hour and give you loads of content if you want it. Yes, please. If you want to be on. So yeah. do you want to do that? Everybody up for that? See a show of hands. I've got to run, I've got to run out the door and back. So cash flow is the key to your success. Financial management. You see, most people think that you know doing whatever they're doing is the most important thing. It isn't. If you're not getting any money in the business, then you haven't got a business. So we've got to manage the money. If you want to make it better and improve it, you've got to manage it. So you've got to know what's coming up in the history and what's looking at the future. So for me, most of that is around business owners making bad decisions because they haven't got the information. So if you have a really strong cash flow forecast, if you listen to that Schneider Electric podcast, both, uh, all of them talk about the importance of their cash flow forecast and all of them didn't have one until they met me, a proper one. Has anyone got a really good cash flow forecast that they're using right now that maybe their accountants kicked them into doing since this COVID stuff has kicked in? Has anybody got one that they're using? Right. Okay. Well, you need to listen all of you on this one then. <laughs> right. So if you want to get it, something to be done better, you've got to, you got to, you got to manage it in order to measure it and to improve it. So um, we look both at the historic numbers looking backwards, but we also look at the future numbers of what's coming at us. Um, knowing your numbers is the language of business. The language of business is all about knowing the numbers. Your business can't talk to you. But you can measure the numbers. So we've got to look at budgeting, which is all about that looking forward. Yeah. And forecasting, looking at what's coming at us, what do we think is coming in? Um, and the way I like to think of it is budgeting and forecasting is like looking at the front windscreen of your car, right? When you drive, would you suggest that it's more important to look at the front windscreen or look in the rear view mirror? What do you reckon? Front, front windscreen, right? Um, okay, and that, if that's the case, and we already said none of you have got a cash flow forecast, which is the front windscreen. Who's looking in the rear view mirror at the P&L? Anybody looking at a and l Do you get a monthly P&L? Which is like looking in the rear view mirror. So at least you're looking at what's gone by, but it's still only 5% you should be looking at the rear view mirror. Most of the time you should be looking at the front windscreen. Do you agree? Mm. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to look at Yes, the information that's gone by is useful, but really we need to look at what's coming in and going forward. And a forecast should be all about measuring what's coming in and what's going out. So I've got an example of a cash flow forecast there. Um, this one was given to me by Chris, who uh, Chris McKenna, who's the accountant from Bully Davy, and Bully Davy is Paul Gedney's accountant. That's how I met him, the guy who just left. So this cash flow forecast, it looks at what's coming in. And what's going out? So the 80-20 rule still stands true. 20% of your uh, uh, client base will provide 80% of your income. So if that's the case, you should be spending your time ratio on those businesses. 80% of your time should be on your top 20% clients. Nurturing them, looking after them, caring for them, speaking to them. You know, find out what you can do to make it better. Okay, the next step is about the cash gap. So we've got to break the cash gap down and reduce it. What happens is you do some work, right? 
you have people working for you and you have to basically pay them at the end of the month. I know it's a shame, but you've got to pay your people, right? So no matter what quality of standard of work they do for you, I might add, you've still got to pay them, right, at the end of the month. So here we go. Then you raise an invoice, right? But unfortunately, your work in progress has taken a bit of time to figure out and you haven't got your paperwork together and blah, 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 blah. Finally, you get your shit together and you raise an invoice. Well done. There you go. So that took a bit of extra time. Um, now, what happens is these people you um, send your invoice to, you don't chase it. You're not on top of it. You don't have a diligent um, uh, um, age debtor system. And so, therefore, they think you took your time to uh, raise the invoice. So we'll take our time to pay it. And you end up with 60 days there. And unfortunately, you've now got a 90 day cash gap. What that means is you've got to cover 90 days worth of money to make your business work in the bank before you get the money you're supposed to for the work you've done. And that's where loads of businesses fail. They don't understand the cash gap. And what we have to do is help you understand the cash gap. Now we can reduce the cash gap. We can do things like make sure you raise your invoices straight away. So that reduces that by 30 days on the whip. Get your whip up into shape, get your work in progress into shape. You can send your invoices out, get on top of it, make sure they're in the right payment cycle with your clients, find out when they're gonna pay and make sure they pay, and maybe they're gonna pay within two weeks. And suddenly you can reduce that cash out down to like 30 or 40 days, and it's much more manageable. So we have to manage the cash in your business. If you're interested in having a catch up with me, yep. um, if you go to, uh, and hopefully Ian, you've put it in the chat box, if you go to electrical, businessmasterclass.com yeah. you can go on there and you can click a button that either books a three hour strategy session with me now it says it's 495 quid on there but for all of you on this call today i'm giving you it's vip 100 that gives you 100 quid off you can get it for 395 if you place the order today or tomorrow basically yeah so we can get you organized um or if you just want a 20 minute chat with me, there's a button you can push there, which is for 20, 20 minutes. So you have to go www.electricalbusinessmasterclass.com. So as I said to Kev, wherever he is, he's not even on here anymore. It's got to be a two hour session. I can't do this in 90 minutes. Um, right. So time tips to improve cash flow. Make sure you get money in. So are you getting, are you making the most of your Sybils? Are you getting your bounce back loan? You're getting money in, get cash in the bank, better in your bank than somebody else's. Are you getting grants in? Have you chased your grants? Have you got your money in? There's a new discretionable grant just been launched this week to the councils. Speak to your local council. You might be able to get a new discretionable grant. If you've been impacted by coronavirus, you can get it. I know that Cambridge came out last week. I know that Northamptonshire I'm waiting for, but I know that Kettering came out this week. So I'm waiting to get that. There's more to grant. And when it's gone, it's gone. So get on it quick. Um, have you spoken to the tax man? Have you made the deferrals of your corporation tax and things like that? Your VAT, you know, obviously you've got to pay it, but you can defer things for right now. Keep hold of your cash. Uh, you get an investment into your business from family, <laughs> friends, private investors, getting the money in. Excuse me. And obviously there's a whole bunch of stuff about getting money up front, getting direct debits. That's what I normally do things on direct debit. Obviously you can place an order today. Just do it on your card. If you're interested in getting that three hour session, I've only got a couple of sessions to offer. So I've got this session and Thursdays and, and, and basically if anyone knows my diary, it's just gone mad at the minute. So I'm booked out for the next two or three weeks anyway. Um, but if you want a strategy session, we'll put one in um, stagger payments, Allow customers to pay up front, which is what I'm doing with you guys. Embrace uh, other methods of payment. Early settlement discounts if you need to get the cash in early, get them to pay early. Ensure prompt billing. Make sure you get your invoices out there. Get that debt system to chase down the money. It's your money. You don't walk out of Tesco, so I'll pay you at some point. See you soon. Thanks for the stuff. Right? Um, you've got to have an attitude. It's your money. Um, Make sure you're reviewing that debtors list. Get on top of the suppliers, chat to them. Make sure the suppliers aren't stitching you up. Make sure that you are paying the right amount of money for the right things. They have a lovely habit, don't they? The wholesalers of um, taking the, uh, offering you a special rate and then not necessarily uh, showing that on the invoice. I've just saved about 13% for a client on a number of invoices we just went through. So get that cash in. It's your cash. 
uh, reduce your overheads, um, dump those degrade clients that we just taking up your time, energy and effort, uh, run credit checks, obviously, uh, credit safe and all that stuff, but it's all going to be messed up for a bit because everybody's figures. So you need to make sure you check in on who you're working with. Don't rely on an old uh, credit check that you have done. So then it's debtor and credit control. Let's get on top of the money. It's your money. Get that money in and also manage your suppliers. Talk to them and manage your agreements and get them arranged, but get that money in. You are owed it. So in terms of, uh, I use Bully Davey, he's really useful at helping people. If anyone wants to chat to him, he said, you, you know, spend, you should be speaking to your accountant every month and at the minute, or at least every quarter. If you're only speaking to them annually, they are not really helping you. They should be working with you, helping you work out your numbers. We know cash flow is king and the most important thing in business right now. If you're not talking to your accountant about having a cash flow forecast, that's crazy. They should all be helping you do this. And that's why he gave me that tool to give out to people. His case study, when he talks about it, is obviously what the work we've done with um, with Paul. Um, so here's the offer that Dave just missed. But where you'll be in five years' time depends on the education you seek, the people you associate with, and the activity that you take. So the education you seek, the people you associate with, and the activity that you take will massively affect where you are in five years' time. So right now, there's two directions you could go. You go, right, thanks, Emerson. You've given me loads of great ideas. I'm going to go and get on with it myself. Great. Hopefully, you'll be successful, and I really hope you are. Um, the second is, right, I'm really interested in getting great results quickly and taking loads of shortcuts and helping, you know, the fact that you've worked with about 10 or so electrical contractors in the last couple of years that really help us, you know, and seeing great results, and they're all over my LinkedIn and all the rest of it. Um, then you want to go quickly. Then what are the options? Uh, Ian, could you silence somebody's dog? I think it might be Chris. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's all right. Which all right, one? Mate. Just, I'll give the silence. I've got four. That's all right. I'm just just sharing the uh, the option here. Right. So the most important bit for me is understanding your market message media model. Um, so we go like, who are the markets that you're after? Who do you actually want to deal with? So it might be that you want to deal with EV or it might be that you want to deal with refrigeration, or it might be you want to deal with um, BMS systems, right? Uh, you know, building, building management systems. You know, you might have areas you have particular skills in. You know, I've got one guy who does it for um, uh, housing associations or whatever. So what markets are you after? So the idea is to segment up the market. Um, in fact, I will draw you this little model. Um, and obviously I'll be giving 10% to little miracles for anything that we, um, we, we take as, uh, as things. And if you don't want any of them, but you want to give money to the home haircut challenge, just to give a donation for today's session, I would really appreciate that. We're so close. I think we're 1,450 quid or something. We're at 50 quid shy of 1500 quid. So we really want to do that. Um, okay. So. You're right about so you don't open your emails. You've got 4,000 you need to open. Oh, mate, I've got thousands <laughs> of them. Uh, I don't really open them now. What I do is I, I've got my PA and I've got a separate account that I look at because I've got so many people sending me absolute dross. <laughs> um, so what I've done is I've set up a separate email address, which is me, um, that is just for me and her. Uh, and then... Um, the world has got Emerson Patton at brightbusinessadvice.com and sends me absolutely tons of shit. So that way you don't have to look at email. Um, and I just have to worry about the ones that are important to me. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, and a load of them are Google as well. Gmail crap. Right. So are we on the screen? Has everyone got the screen up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. There we go. Right. So the market, the message and the media. So the market is understand your target market. So who are you dealing with? We already explained that. Understand the language, what matters to them. The message is what language you're going to take, say to them, but also on what platform you're going to give them that message because people have got different platforms that they like. Yeah. So you've got to think about, you know, is it Teams, is it Slack, is it Zoom, if it's internal stuff, you know, is it external, is it social media, what platforms are you putting your message on? 
And remember, when you implement this stuff, like Paul Gedney's done, as you saw today, he's got an amazing business. And what he's done with that business is he's been able to step away from it slightly, been able to get time back, been able to go on holiday, been able to enjoy time with his family. And not only that, he's been able to grow the business, more clients, more work, more future business. So he's got stability. And that's really what we've helped him do, get structure in his business and put stability back into his life. So resetting, uh, here's the things you can have. You might just want a Zoom, one-to-one -one Zoom call for an hour. That is 95 quid, special event price, 95 pounds, saving you uh, 155 pounds on a normal coaching session. So I'm doing to try and help. And you can book on electricalsummit.co.uk or in fact, the other one is really most, the best one now, which is the, oh, thanks a lot. Somebody's, somebody's doing some printing right now. Perfect in my house. Um, okay. Or you might want to join our masterclass. So our masterclass, if you register today, you're just registering your interest. You're not registering that you want to buy it, but we're going to start running it in September, which is one session a month, in-depth session, just like we do on the summit, but we're going to do one session, 90 minutes, leadership, one session, finance, one session, uh, and go into real depth on it. So if you're interested, you just go on to the um, electrical business masterclass and register your place. It doesn't mean you're going to pay for it now. It just means you're interested. So we just find out if I can get 10 people, then I'll run it. Uh, and then the other thing is, do you just want some one-on-one -on -one time with me? Brainstorm your business. 395 quid is the special rate if you use the VIP 100, um, which will get you the promo code. So if you go on, anyone wants to go on and place the order today, obviously first come, first served, um, go to electricalbusinessmasterclass.com. Uh, I've got about five spots and I've got two events. So I'm sure we'll fill them. We did last time. Uh, and obviously there's a bonus anybody that takes action and actually books a strategic session with me today will get the masterclass for free when I run it so anyone who goes right actually I want to do their masterclasses when they come up but I want this strategic session right now if you go on and book the strategy session I'll give you a code that will let you on the masterclass for free uh, when we run it so um, that's really the offer so you either go two directions do it yourself thanks very much off we go and that's good for you hopefully you'll get what you want or you really want to get great results proven track record i know how to use this system better than anybody else because i designed it i made it work and if you want to move to the next level quickly with your business you can either have a one-to-one -one crisis call just to have a chat a bit more depth um you can have a uh, join our masterclass series which is going to just roll out uh, in September and get education or you might want to get on it quickly as you can and do a strategy session. We'll build you a plan mm -hmm. to get you going and that's three, nine, five to get your plan in place. Um, and obviously anybody who books from these webinars over the next couple of days, I'm going to give you a free place on the masterclass. So that's really it. Action takers book yourself a strategy session. You get the masterclass for free uh, today which is saving you basically 595 quid. Um, so if you fancy that, all it leaves me to say is, well done, guys. I think we deserve a beer now. Hope you like the joke there. <laughs> and uh, that's me finished for today. Okay, so I hope you really enjoyed the session today, everybody. You got some great ideas. Of course, Nobody gets anything for doing nothing. You've got a information, but if you take no action, nothing's going to happen. You know, I have a personal trainer, as I said, he makes me work harder than I do myself. So if you want to work harder in your business and get something more, you need to work harder on yourself and get the results you want from developing your knowledge, developing your skills. And where they say you'll be in five years time, that will depend on the people you associate with, with the education that you take and with the action you do to get on with it so if you don't do any of those things you aren't going to get the results you want so i really think that right now the next step could either be book a quick 20 minute chat with me if you're not sure what to do next book a one hour crisis call if you've got one specific thing that you want to deal with or if you've got 
multiple things and you're not really sure what you'll do and you need to replan your business, then one of our three hour strategic sessions will be what you need to make your business whole again and figure out where you're going to go and just spend that time focusing on taking your business forward. And then, of course, we've got our masterclass series coming up to educate yourself. And of course, anybody that takes a strategic session will get a free place on the masterclass if you place the order before we start the masterclass series. Thank you.